What's up guys, it's a new sensation, big annotation here, and I managed to place third place in the Leicester 1k tournament for Star Wars Unlimited, hosted by UKTC or UK Tournament Center, uh, that just went by this weekend, and I was playing this hand green list that you can see here on the screen behind me. Um, so I wanted to just make a video sort of breaking down the list, breaking down uh, a different few different aspects of the list, a um, few different matchups that I wanted to highlight on, and just my overall experience in playing the deck. Um, before I get into anything, I have to give a massive shout out to Swoop Racers. They are a Polish YouTube channel, um, and they both play S Star Wars Unlimited, and they both make very, very good videos on um, the game, and wide variety of decks, lots of good gameplay, very informative. Um, and they're actually the ones who publicized this deck, or popularized it, sorry. Um, so that's where I got the idea to play this deck. I've been following them since they started posting videos on it, because um, me and my teammate Tom are both massive fans of uh, Zoo Warlock, if any of you have played Hearthstone. And this deck plays very similarly to that deck. So we both saw this video and we were like, okay, we need to, we need to keep an eye on this list maybe give it a couple of tries, and then as Swoop Racers obviously developed the list, we kept up with it, um, we kept testing it, and yeah, it just gelled really well with how we liked playing the game. So we both ended up taking it to the Leicester 1k. Um, like I said, I managed to finish third. Tom, I believe, finished 19th, going... F it would have been 5-2, so strong showing from both of us, obviously. Um, I ended up going 6-1. My matchups throughout the day were three Sabines, a Boba Cunning, uh, a Mando Red, a Ray Yellow, and a Han Blue, the new hand deck, not the old hand leader. So, quite a widespread. Um, obviously, a lot of very strong decks in there, especially the three Sabines, the Boba Cunning, the Han Blue. Um, those are those are sub considered some of the top decks right now as well, so it was very nice to have a good spread of very strong matchups to be able to prove how good the deck was. Um, and yeah, it's it's definitely got legs. I think it's one of the strongest decks in the format right now. I'm surprised that not more people are playing it, to be honest. Um, so I'll get straight into it. To be honest, when it comes to the deck list, I'm not going to break down a huge amount. Um, like I say, it's not my list. Uh, I made a couple of changes, but the skeleton of the list is Swoop Racers. So when it comes to breaking down the actual deck and going through the deck list, I'd highly recommend checking out their videos instead. Um, that's not something that I can give better insight on than them, so it's not something that I should good do, I don't think. Um, so I'm going to have the links to their videos breaking down the list uh, in the description below, so if you're really interested in this deck and you want to give that a watch, you want to understand a lot more behind the card choices and everything like that, then I'd highly recommend that. Um, what I'm going to be doing more is going over a couple of the card choices. There's there's a few ones that I found very interesting that I either really liked or really disliked. Um, a couple of changes that I'd consider making to the list going forward if I were to play it again at an event. And going over the... I think I only made one change to the actual list, but going over that change as well. Um, and then I wanted to mainly focus this video on going over matchups. Um, I've picked out four of the decks that I think you'll most likely see at, at an event, like a regionals or a planetary qualifier, anything like that. Um, so I've picked out the top four decks that I think you'll be seeing in those big events, and I'm just going to break down how you play that matchup, sort of the playstyle approach that you would take, as well as the cards that you want to be looking for in the early couple of turns, so that you know how to mulligan effectively into those decks and everything. Um, just because I personally found that that was something that... Um, I didn't see Swoop Racers covering, so I didn't want to, you know, I'm not trying to step on their toes here. If they've done stuff about this deck, then I don't want to come in with stuff clashing with that, but I didn't see them doing any sort of matchup breakdowns uh, in massive detail, so I figured that's something I could cover. And uh, maybe if they end up watching this video, they can comment below and tell me why I'm wrong on some of those bits. <laughs> um, but yeah, going into the list, as you can see here, it's... Um, pretty standard. I think I only made one change in the sideboard to the original Swoop Racers list, which I think is the first thing that I'll cover. So the one change that I did make was instead of three home ones in the sideboard, I opted to play a copy of Choose Sides. 
Um, I am slightly biased towards this card just because I love the card. Uh, it reminds me of my favorite Yu-Gi-Oh card. Um, so <laughs> I, I was very excited to see it revealed and I've wanted to play it in a couple of decks since. Um, but I genuinely think that it is a very strong card and I think that it has a space in this deck to be played. Um, I only wanted to play it as a one-off because it's not a unit, so it's not as valuable uh, in this deck because it doesn't play into what the deck is trying to do in terms of swimming the board. You can't use it with your hand leader skill, obviously. So there's a lot of um, diminishing returns that can come from playing more than one copy of Choose Sides, but I believe that one copy is a good spot for it to be at rather than pl not playing it at all because it offers a lot of value um, in some of your worst case scenarios like it offers outs to avenge it, it offers outs to fet, spray, fet fire spray if a game against boba cunning goes that long um, and other big bombs like crate dragon as well that kind of thing it's just kind of your um escape button if you really need to out a card that you can't just make a good trade into and I think it offers good value because of the fact that home one is unique and it can come down the same turn as home one. So it just allows for um, less diminishing returns on the home one because if you have two copies of home one in your hand, the second copy is going to be pretty much useless until the first copy dies. It's going to be very rare that you override a home one with another home one just to get the on play effect. So I wanted to have a copy of two sides instead of the third home one just to reduce the possibility of double drawing those home ones a little bit um, whilst also offering outs to some big bombs when it comes to those worst case scenarios which I felt like was something that I should allow myself to prepare for a lot of the time the sideboard is for those worst case scenarios or those worst case matchups I feel like um, so that's the reasoning behind the one change that I did make with the two sides um, it also allows for like I say outs to Avenger and big bombs but also can be really nice in the Boba Cunning matchup if things get a bit out of hand. There are times where um, Boba Yellow could draw an amazing hand and you can draw not so well. Um, and then it gets to those turn six, turn seven points where they are just slamming fire sprays with new adventure and it can allow you to get out of that situation as well. Like I say, it's a lot more of a situational card than home one, um, but it also just allows for less diminishing returns when it comes to double drawing cards like home one because of the fact that it's unique and it'll come down on the same turn anyways. Um, going through the rest of the sideboard, Scanning Officer was a card that I really wanted in the main deck because it has huge blowout potential versus pretty much every deck in the game right now. Um, even if it's not a smuggle focus deck like a Hondo or a Han Yellow, um, or if it's even if it's not just running tech altogether. There's a lot of decks that are just running one or two smuggle cards, like Boba Yellow can run DJ, it can run Jetpack, it can run Hotshot DL44. So Boba Yellow might even just be resourcing a lot of those cards. Um, obviously, they're not going to run all of those cards, but it comes down to personal preference. I find a lot of people running one or two of those cards in their Boba Yellow lists. Sabine obviously runs Cassian a lot of the time as a finisher, but also as a 3-5. And uh, Kira will run cards like Lompike. So even in these top decks that aren't at all smuggle oriented, there's one or two cards that just happen to be able to smuggle in to get extra benefit, which they'll obviously want to resource. So Scanning Officer can be nice to potentially blow them out on turn one where you drop Scanning Officer, you flip up one smuggle, and then um, they can't play their turn one play. And then you, you just have the board control from there, which is perfect, especially in a matchup like Boba Cunning or Sabine, where, you know, the board control early is everything. You just need to get that board control, and that's where you win the game. Um, so I really wanted Scanning Officer in the main for that reason, but realistically, the two-drop lineup is too strong. We can't really flexibly cut a lot of these two-drops, and the one-drops we obviously want a lot of copies of for Mass Kanata. So there wasn't really any space for me to fit the scanning officer into the main. Um, so I just kept it in the side for a matchup like Han Yellow. But it can also be nice just to replace any weak cards in a lot of matchups so that you potentially have that blowout potential. Like if there's cards in the main that you just think aren't very good in the matchup, you can swap them out for the scanning officer. And it's always going to be a decent-ish card. You can even cheat it in as a 2-1 off of Han's skill because it's a 2-3, which is great. Um, I did want a third Heroic Sacrifice in the deck, just because it provides a lot of top deck outs in races, especially against Sabine, I think it's a really huge card. 
Um, that partly might be due to my lack of knowledge in the Sabine matchup. It's not a matchup that I tested at all before the event, um, which was definitely an oversight from myself. Um, I, I think I was just a bit lazy in the testing process, and also I didn't really have a dedicated Sabine player in my circle to test against, so it made it a little bit harder to get that testing. Uh, it just came down to hoping that I queued into it on Carabas, which I maybe got like one or two games against, but it's really not that informative, um, unfortunately. So I kind of went into the event without much knowledge on the Sabine matchup, just based purely on theory. And I, yeah, I found myself missing the Heroic Sacrifice in a lot of the games that I played into Sabine where I didn't find it. Um, and obviously I played three rounds into Sabine, so that's three best of threes. Um, so I do feel like it's possible that Heroic Sacrifice, I would like to take it back up to three copies. Um, but maybe... I'm, I'm trying to remember if there was any points where I'd seen the Heroic Sacrifice but resourced it and maybe should have resourced another card. Because um, there is a possibility of that being the case as well. So it's worth testing around with two, I think, uh, and seeing how it feels. I think the Sabine matchup is just something I need to work on a li little bit more. And um, I was also trying out Bright Hope, or I was trying without Bright Hope for this event, as advised by Sweet Process in one of their videos. Um, basically, the logic behind that is that the card is strongest into Boba Yellow, but we have that matchup figured out now. Um, it just requires a change in playstyle, and so the Bright Hope isn't necessary in the build anymore. So it allows for cards like Wing Leader to be added, which then um, help bolster the Sabine matchup quite a lot. And it's also pretty solid into Boba and just generally a very solid turn two play. So it's it's a, a very nice card to have. So after playing the tournament and a bit of testing that I did the day before into um, Boba Yellow, I do agree that Bright Hope isn't actually necessary for the list. It's one of those cards where it's good into everything, but it's not actually amazing into everything. Like, it's not winning you games that you weren't going to win anyways, realistically. And so you can just replace it to for a, for a card like Wing Leader, in this case, um, which will just bolster some of the matchups that might be a little bit trickier, a little bit more 50-50. Um, I love the one-of attack pod. I think that this is a great inclusion into the list. Um, again, it's a card that you're only going to want to play once per game. It's, again, like choose sides. Um, it is, again, a very situational card. Uh, again, like choose sides, which is where you would include a card as, as one copy instead of maybe two or three. But when it does come down, it can be absolutely game-changing. It can be used as a finisher, obviously. Um, it can be used alongside ECL to get the um, maximum value out of the grit. It can also be cheated in off of hand to get a little bit extra value off of the grit. Um, but it can also just be used to be played on turn 5 or turn 6 if you haven't seen a Poe, an IG, or a Wrecker. It's just another option as top end, which is super nice. A lot of the time the card does end up in resource in those early turns because the hand size doesn't get very big in this deck realistically. And you also want to keep multiple options depending on what your opponent plays in the early turns. So a lot of the times the attack pod does end up resourced, but when it comes up, it comes up in big ways and you can really feel the power of it. And again, into those, especially into those control matchups where they're spending a lot of their turns clearing the board that you've already developed, cards like Gorilla Attack Pod alongside Cassian that can come in ready have huge potential just to push damage and end games. Um... The IG is another nice one-off just to increase the uh, potential to find extra 5 drops on turn 5 or turn 4, 5 resource. Um, and has a similar logic to the Gorilla Attack Pod in that it's just another 6 drop or another 5 drop that you can potentially ECL in if you need to. Uh, IG is there a lot more for the ECL rather than the Attack Pod. Um, it's especially good into those 6 health leaders that deploy on turn 4. Um, and it can be very nice just to get the 3 damage against a deck like Han Blue or Kira, where a lot of their units will be damaged from various trades or from their leader skills. Then the IG-11 can come up in a much bigger way than Poe sometimes, so a lot of the time it has bigger payoff than Poe. Uh, but a lot of the time it's just there, if your opponent is running a 6 health leader or less that deploys on resource 5, then it's there as another potential ECL target if you don't see your Poe's. A lot of the time it does get sided out. Um, if it's not relevant, like into a Palpatine or a Jabba, it's not going to be too amazing. Um, it can still be nice just as extra top end, but it's not great as an ECL target into those. Um, so yeah, that sort of thing. Or if you're playing against 
Boba Fett, it's not going to kill their leader, because their leader's a 4-7, even though it deploys on 5, so it might not be so good into that. Uh, and you don't necessarily need a lot of top end into Boba Fett either, so there is that. Um, the one card that I did have a problem with in the main was Timely Intervention. I really like it as a one-off card. Um, I think it provides a lot of value, especially with the fact that it can be smuggled, so you can resource it. Uh, similar to Gorilla Attack Pod, a lot of the time it ends up in your resource, but because of that smuggle skill, it is still actually useful in the resource, which is super nice. Uh, and it also offers a lot of value whilst not increasing any diminishing returns there, because you're only including the one copy. And I feel like a card like Timely Intervention, as well as most of the events in this list, the same with True Sides, the same with Heroic Sacrifice, offer it, end up giving a lot of diminishing returns when you're doing things like double drawing them because it goes against what the deck is trying to do. You're trying to see a lot of units, play a lot of units, keep a wide board, and then you can use um, cards like Heroic Sacrifice and Cassian to end the game. Um, I didn't like Timely Intervention because it ended up feeling too situational when I was playing it. Um, it just n it didn't come up as much as I was hoping it would. And I don't know whether that was just because the matchups were not so great for it, or I wasn't, maybe maybe it's just not a card that I'm used to playing and it wasn't something that was on my mind all the time. I wonder if there were some spots where I could have used it where I didn't even think of it. So it's something that I will keep testing going forward, but right now for me it's the weakest card in the list personally, and I will also consider switching out for the third Heroic Sacrifice which uh, performs a similar job, but helps you a lot more in those race scenarios, in my opinion. Uh, it does increase diminishing returns, which is unfortunate, but uh, like I say, it's something that I'm going to test around with. I think there's definitely merits to both options. But that is pretty much everything I have to say about the list. Overall, the list is amazing. I think it's really well made. And again, massive shout out to Swoop Races for, for that. And also a big shout out to Tom from my team, Iratorum, for testing the list with me. Like I said, we both ended up playing um, very similar lists. The only difference was he had Bright Hope in the sideboard over the two Ketsu. I kept Ketsu in just in the case that it came up in the Bosk matchup, um, which I didn't end up playing. But it's just there, just in case. I don't think Bosk is the most popular deck in the world, but it's meant to be a very bad matchup for the list, for the deck. So Ketsu can just help out with that. But like I said, that's pretty much all I have to say about the list. Um, I did want to go on to some of the matchups and break down sort of how I believe these matchups should be played. So starting off with Sabine, and I think I said before, but this is probably the matchup that I have the least experience in. Um, definitely before the event it was, and probably still after the event. I did play three rounds of Sabine, managed to win two of them. And the one loss that I did have was against Sabine. Uh, I think this was just due to my lack of experience. In one of the games, I was one damage off lethal, and I think there was a way that I could have uh, got there. But again, it was just due to my own mistakes and my own lack of understanding of how the matchup was meant to go. I'm not generally an aggro player, so playing these like aggressive mirror matches is very new to me. Um, so it was something that I had to learn on the fly on the day. And yeah, it was it was definitely quite a challenge, but hopefully I've learned enough that I can give some information on it to you guys now. So when it comes to playing against Sabine and playing against Aggro in general, I want to preface this point by saying that this is not a Han versus Sabine specific thing. This is just a playing against Aggro specific thing. So you can use this very generally in a lot of your matchups. This particular um, point that I have but it's just that you can open with passes on your turn one to see what two drop that they play. And the reason behind that is that um, a lot of the time aggro decks will want to do something called arena dodging, which for those that don't know, it means they want to play in space if you're going to play in ground because they're going to be able to output more damage than you, faster than you. So as long as their units go uncontested, they will win the game. And if they play their two drop first and you have two options to, on what to play, say you have a space unit and a ground unit, then if you open by passing and then they play a two drop, you know what they're going to play, or you know what they've played, 
So you can match the arena if it's a good trade. If it's not a good trade, then you can arena dodge and maybe play into the arena that they've played in a little bit later, trying to catch up with an ECL, that sort of thing. But it just gives you more information going into your turn one and turn two plays. Um, now, you may ask, well, if I pass on turn one, if I have the initiative, what happens if they claim initiative? Um, and for me, in my opinion, that is, again, a good result for you. Um, just generally, Sabine is going to be the more aggressive deck, but I also believe that Sabine is a more aggressive deck than Hanzu. Um, it can depend on the start and how the game plays out. They do both play very similarly, to be honest. But in my eyes, uh, Han can play slightly more control than Sabine would um, and wants to go slightly later often. Um, but it does need to close out games before the damage racks up on the base and the burst from Sabine is able to close out the game. But in my opinion, uh, Han plays as the control in the matchup a lot of the time, just because it wants to keep control of the board, so it, it kind of needs to take a lot of the value trades. Um, like I say, it does depend on the situation. But back to the original point, if they end up claiming as a Sabine player, that's generally good for you, because it means you're going to be able to get to the later game faster. Both players haven't played a 2-drop, so you just go to turn 2, and that's going to be good for the control deck, which most of the time is not going to be Sabine, right? Um, and this is often the reason why you'll see Sabines who have started with initiative just use their hero skill or their leader skill before they play anything, just to ping one damage on both players, because they want to see what two drop you're going to play, and then they can react to it by dodging on the other arena or playing a two drop that will take a good trade into it um, so that they can get control of the board. So a lot of the time, that's why they end up just pinging when they have initiative and this is why you want to just be passing into them or you can even just let them start with the initiative when it comes to like games two or game three if you haven't won the uh won the dice roll or won the previous game then you can choose to just give them initiative and then they're forced to play into you and you get to react to whatever their plays are uh, and this kind of ties in with the most valuable resource in the matchup in my opinion uh, which is the Energy Conversion Lab Epic Action. Um, this is a crazy skill in the matchup for both players to have. Um, and obviously when I talk about Sabine, I'm talking about Sabine with ECL here because I think that's just the undisputed strongest version at the moment. Um, but the reason why it's so strong is because both players have access to cards like Poe and Wrecker, which are huge comeback tools when it comes to board presence, but also can act as huge burst damage. Um, they're just amazing overall threats in the matchup. Um, but it also can be used just to get board control, which is a huge part of the matchup as well. So um, I think the reason why I lost my one match that I did against Sabine was because I wasn't using ECL correctly. Um, and if I'd used ECL a little bit earlier in the game that I was one damage off lethal, then I think it would have saved me enough health as well as developing my board to be able to turn the tide of the game. Obviously can't say for sure because the game would have played out very differently, but I think that is where my main mistake came from, to be honest. Um, so when it comes to my sort of general notes, the thing with this matchup is you can't have, and the thing with a lot of matchups is you can't have absolute rules in card games. Um, so these are not to be taken as like absolute 100% you do this all the time. This is just kind of my general notes from where I think I was personally going wrong. Um, and I hope that that helps some of you out in keeping this, this sort of thing in mind as well. Um, but I think that you can, my first one is that I think you can only go for ECL Wrecker if you get ahead in the early game. Um, if you end up becoming ahead in the early game, I think whoever gets ahead in the early game in this kind of a matchup, the other player is kind of forced to use ECL to catch up. So if you're ahead in the early game, your opponent is going to be forced to use ECL, and then that means you can maybe save your ECL, but you also you get a little bit of breathing room in the time that you had control of the board, which allows for you to save ECL a little bit longer, be a little bit more greedy with it, and then you can ECL Wrecker for a big blowout. Um, generally, that is not going to happen, and you're already in a winning position if that has happened. 
So that's just something to bear in mind. Uh, I think ECL Poe is a lot more realistic in this matchup because not only can it kill their leader the turn after it deploys, so they only get one swing out of it, but it also potentially outs the Dark Saber, which can be a big issue if you don't use Poe on it. Uh, Dark Saber plus your lead plus, plus the Sabine leader is going to push huge damage, but the fact they can also drop it on, you know, other units potentially the Sabine two drop, but also just like any unit realistically because of the fact that they're running a green base can be very scary. So Poe um, outing the Dark Saber can be huge. Um, but also something to keep in mind is ECLing on their turn one and two plays should be something that you can look for to prevent damage and just to get board control early through a value trade. Um, something that I did in the match that I had on stream against the Sabine player in round three, which you guys can check out the VOD for as well over on Thork's Hot Takes channel, which I'll see if I can get a link for that below as well, if you guys wanna watch my game or any of the games throughout the day. Um, something that I did in my match against the Sabine on stream there was he played a Sabine two drop turn one in the second game. And I responded by just using Energy Conversion Lab, bringing in Battlefield Marine, killing his 2-drop, and then I had board control from there, and I was even able to free play a 1-drop alongside that. Um, I think that's something that you can and should be looking for a lot of the time in this matchup, and that's something that I massively undervalued in the match against Sabine that I lost. So I think that's something that I need to work on myself as well. Um... Also, just being able to ECL like 3-4s or 3-5s into their turn 1 play is potentially an option as well. Um, and a lot of the matchup, I feel like, can come down to the turn 1 and 2 plays, because that's where the early board control happens, which then dictates who has to ECL first, which then dictates who gets the better ECL, realistically. So, And it also dictates who gets to push more damage in the early game which is a, a massive factor in this matchup because both decks have quite a lot of burst damage. Sabine more so, absolutely, but Han still has access to Cassia and Reckless Gunslinger. Potential Poe pings on the base or Wrecker ECL Overwhelm can do a lot of damage as well. So yeah, just something to bear in mind. Um, and so I focused a lot of this slide on the early plays that Sabine can do and what you can potentially react with. So I'll go into that now. But pretty much, if you if they open with a Sabine 2-drop, you end up having a lot of answers because you can, if you have a Sabine 2-drop yourself, you can use Energy Conversion Lab into their Sabine 2-drop and then you get board control there. Um, and the same thing with Battlefield Marine, which I've already mentioned. And this play line is especially good if you also have a 1-drop to follow up with. So you have two units in the ground and they've got none going into their turn two. That's going to be absolutely huge. You get to push some damage on base. Often forces an ECL back to try and get re return uh, board control. But then you're already going to be ahead at that point. And they kind of need to hold on to ECL to get a massive blowout one with either Poe or Wrecker by that point. Uh, which allows you to push quite a lot of damage to base through the ground arena there. Um, so Sabine 2-drop is kind of the worst opener for them, and this is all bearing in mind the idea that they're going to be playing a 2-drop before you are, because you're going to be either giving them initiative or just open passing on turn 1. Um, if you have a Heroic Renegade, it's kind of the worst opener into um, Sabine, I think, depending on which 2-drop they play. If, they, if you have a Heroic Renegade and they play a Sabine 2-drop, then you can play it as just a 2-3, so that if they hit it, it will trade back. You, they can't get a value trade there. But realistically, it's probably the worst one into that because they can just go face and it'll push more damage than the Heroic Renegade because they'll be pushing 3 to face per turn. You'll be pushing 2 to face per turn, which isn't good for you, obviously. But it also means that the Sabine has higher potential to trade into your other units that you play. So if they do need to take a trade, if you play a Sabine 2-drop at any point during the game, they can take that value trade as well. Um, and yeah, it's it's not an ideal opener for you, to be honest. Um, the other main option that they're going to go for is they will open the Battlefield Marine. And if they do this, then Sabine 2-drop is kind of useless. You don't really want to ECL just to get a 1-for-1 one one trade. That's pretty bad. Um, playing your own Battlefield Marine is kind of fine to match, but Heroic Renegade can be really strong, um, as you can cheat it in as a 4-1, and then they're almost forced to trade as 
similar to the previous situation with the Renegade, but the reverse, you're going to be pushing 4 damage to base, whereas they'll only be pushing 3 damage to base per turn. So they're going to want to take that trade into that. Um, this is going to be especially nice if you also have an R2-D2, as it's the only other 1-drop that doesn't die to a Marine because of the fact you'll play it as a 1-4. And the other 1-drops all have 1 or 3 health. Um, this is also probably best done on games 2 and 3, as there it's possible they'll side out the Sabine 2-drop for other 2-drop options or other options in general out of the fear of the turn 1 ECL play that we mentioned before with the Sabine 2 drop from ourselves or from the Battlefield Marine. So it's very possible that Sabine players do side out the Sabine 2 drop against us. Um, if they don't and they drop a turn 2 Sabine with ECL into the 4-1 then it can be a huge punish because of the fact that um, the 1 damage from the Sabine will kill the Heroic Renegade so then they have a Marine and a Sabine and you still have your three man open to make a play, but you've lost board control at that point. You're going to have to use ECL to get it back or you play some very good statted units like a Cassian. So that can be pretty rough. Um, like I say, I think that's what makes it better as a play in games two and three is it's very possible that they'll either mulligan or side out the Sabine two drop, especially if you pulled off the actual play going into game one. Um, so that can be a big punish, but to be honest, I'm not sure how much of a punish it is because it does then give you the ECL advantage. Um, and whilst they do have board control, it means that on turn two, they've only played a Sabine two drop, which isn't going to be the best in terms of development from them. So it's something that I would need to test out myself a little bit more. This is a lot of this is all based on theory, but uh, that is, again, another play that is potentially something to watch out for. Um, the other big punish can be a wing leader as it would boost their marine to a 5-5 five five, and you can't drop one of your own as Renegade isn't a rebel. So you'll be, uh, they'll either be able to take a value trade into the Renegade or just push more damage to your base per turn. Um, if they end up going base then there are things you can do about that. If they end up value trading I think that's probably the worst outcome. Um, and that's where you might need to follow up with just something with one attack or a Sabine 2 drop to try and trade back into it. Um, in terms of the rest of the plays that you can go for, Wing Leader in general is a great turn 2 play to buff Sabine or buff a Marine or even an R2-D2. Um, ideally, you do want to end up going quite wide against Sabine. Um, as if you're able to drop the ideal opener of like a Maz Kanata and two one drops, then it'll often just force out an ECL on turn 2 to clear the Maz Kanata before it gets out of control. Which is huge because, again, you get the ECL advantage. And like I said before, I think that's the biggest resource in this kind of a matchup. And probably the biggest skill gap uh, determiner that will come from the matchup as well. I think whichever player uses ECL more effectively is generally going to end up on top. Um, and speaking of ECL, another play that you can go for is ECL on red 3, which can be great if they open into an A-Wing. Uh, I think there is potentially a world where you skip turn 1 to do this, um, because again, they'll have initiative, so they'll play their 2-drop before you get to make a play. Um, and that is solely to prevent the turn 2 wing leader punish. Uh, it depends on the state of your hand if you think that you can race a buffed up A-Wing. Um, and so if you can, then you're able to take that risk. But if you can't, then maybe it's safer just to take initiative and develop the red three, killing their two drop. Um, this can also just generally be a great play if they play a naked red three at any point during the game. Smashing your red three into theirs is going to be huge because it means that it's buffing up, you know, all of your ground units, but it also gives you control of space at the same time. Um, and is going to kind of let you push three damage to uh, base every turn for free, plus whatever you get from your ground units. Um, after sideboard, you have Merc Gunship to kind of achieve the same thing as Red 3, but you don't have to necessarily skip your turn one if you're scared of that wing leader play. So that is a very nice sideboard. Um, and yeah, pretty much uh, the rest of it is just keep an eye out on their ECL. Um, think about their ECL potential plays. If it gets to those five or six resource points and they haven't used it, you have to really be careful of ECL Wrecker or ECL Poe. And overall, 
I, I'm not experienced in the matchup, so I still need to test it more. But I think, yeah, it's a it's a very interesting matchup to play. Uh, it's very back and forth. There's a lot of things to consider. Um, and it often just comes down to figuring out whether you think you can race them or not, or whether you need to just keep taking value trades and trying to keep the board as controlled as possible. Um, if they are... If they are using um, ECL early and you're saving ECL, then it's often important to take trades so that you can get to the point where ECL, Poe, and Wrecker will win you the board and then hopefully the game before they get to the point where they can just burst you down with card for a cause. So you just got to try and mitigate base damage in those situations. Um, but if they're, save if they're the ones saving ECL and you're the one using ECL early, then you need to be trying to close out the game as soon as possible, sending as much face as possible. Because if you've used ECL early, you'll probably have board control, so you need to capitalize on that whilst you can, uh, before they use a big ECL with Poe and Wrecker to swing the board back in their favor and uh, hit back very hard and very fast. So that's generally my notes for Sabine. Uh, like I say, I think the matchup is very interesting. Not one that I've got a huge amount of experience in, but hopefully my theory is uh, helpful enough to you guys. Um, going on to the other matchups, and this is one that I have a little bit more knowledge in, luckily. Um, this is one that me and Tom both tested extensively because we were both very concerned about the matchup. Um, and we were initially taking a lot of value trades, like pretty much wherever we could. Um, and we'd have board control for most of the game and then suddenly out of nowhere it would be like fire spray is coming down and I'm getting cunninged back to back uh, or even double cunninged in some turns. And even though I've taken all these good value trades and I've cleared their board every single turn, they've never been able to push damage to face throughout the whole game. Um, their leader has been one shot and I've been able to push consistent damage every turn. Suddenly I'm just losing the game because they've got these like massive finisher cards and complete blowout cards like Cunning and Fett's Fire Spray that they've been allowed time to not only get to, but also just time to draw copies of them, which is actually very important and very relevant to think about when it comes to playing a deck like this that can switch between playing a long game and being very aggressive. Um, so it turns out with this matchup, um, Tom ended up dropping a couple comments on the Swoop Racer videos asking their advice on it, and it turns out pretty much what you want to do is almost exclusively go face, um, other than getting maybe a good trade into their turn one play just to guarantee board control, you're sending everything face, um, and just trying to brick their plays by making uh, good plays on your end rather than taking the good trades, um, but also just going face, they don't really have a huge amount of ways to actually deal with um, your board when you go wide. The only real comeback tool they have is Cunning, which is only really a temporary comeback tool, and it's more of a tool to help them race with than con help control the board. Um, they don't really have many great ways to control the board, and taking too many trades lets them play that control game too easily as you're not pressuring them enough. And they're able to just get good value trades with cards like Forlom or more cunning plays. And then it lets you get to that big fire spray, new adventure, cunning endgames. So ideally, you just go wide from the jump with Maz and some one drops. Uh, obviously, that's not going to be possible every game because we'd love for that to happen every game, but it just won't. Um, but your alternative is going to be ideally a Sabine 2 drop as it bricks Crafty Smuggler and Greedo plays, which are... Most Boba Yellow's um, opening plays. I, I guess I should specify this is mainly talking about Boba Yellow rather than Boba Green. Boba Green is a slightly different matchup. It's a lot trickier because of access to cards like Overwhelming Barrage as well as the possibility of Ramp. Uh, but it's also a lot less popular at the moment because it's a lot weaker into a wider field, I believe. So Boba Yellow is the main one that we're talking about right now. Um... So, going back to the opening plays, uh, like I said, Sabine 2 drop is great as it will just kill Crafty Smuggler and Greedo if you have initiative. Um, the main scary opener that they can have is a Viper Probe Droid, as that's their only real other 2 drop that they're going to play in the ground arena. Um, I don't believe it's played in every Boba Yellow list, but I do think that it is 
an optimal card to play in Bobo Yellow. And it's going to be worse for you if you only have a 2-drop, because the Viper Probe Droid can trade back into Sabine, like, the 1 damage ping and the... The 1 damage ping doesn't change the fact that they're going to trade there. But Wing Leader does solve that issue, as well as being able to then brick 4 Lom on 4 resources, as, um... They're not going to be tra able to trade into the Sabine with the Viper Probe, so you can just take it out, and then you have board control, or you can even just ignore it and go face, which is honestly probably better. Um, and then Sabine will be sat there as a 4-5 on turn 3, so on 4 resources, you'll probably ideally be playing a K2SO. And then their 4-resource their four turn of potential 4 long to get a nice value trade is completely bricked. Um, the Forlom's, the best thing Forlom can do is just trade with K2, which you're very happy with because you get the, um, when defeated skill. So it's a one for one, but you actually get either three damage burst or potential discard. It's going to be the three damage burst most of the time there. Um, so even though there's potential for you to get a two for one in the best case scenario for, for them, you just go for the three damage a lot of the time. But Forlom is a huge card that uh, is can be very annoying to play around, so the fact that Wing Leader bricks that is absolutely huge. Um, something else that Wing Leader does is it also bricks Cunning, as if you open Battlefield Marine instead of Sabine, which can be another strong opener into them, um, it is nice into Crafty Smuggler as they don't get to trade without a shoot first, which most lists aren't running nowadays. Um, it's not great into Greedo, and it's also not great into Viper Probe Droid, but it's still a potential opener that you might just have to deal with sometimes. But if you follow it up with a Wing Leader immediately, then it becomes a 5-5, so they can't even bounce it with Cunning to remove the buff. Um, the main thing that Wing Leader play does get countered by is a Waylay or a Relentless Pursuit, um, as the buff will obviously fall off then. But those, card those cards aren't generally seeing as much play throughout Boba Cunning lists from what I've seen. Um, and they're also only going to be relevant if you open, like, your absolute weakest, which is um, a 2-drop plus a wing leader. This is kind of the weakest playline that you get to go for, and they have to open God Hand for you to um, be forced into playing it, because they have to open Viper Probe Droid to punish the 2-drop, and they have to open the Waylay. Uh, Relentless Pursuit doesn't really come into play until much later, because of the fact that they ideally want to use it on a Bounty Hunter unit. But, yeah, they kind of have to open ideally, and you have to open very suboptimally for that to actually punish you, so I'm kind of okay with playing into that when it comes to it. Um, but it also only delays um, the effect, because Relentless Pursuit and um, Waylay, they're not actually removing the 2-drop, they're just bouncing it back to hand or capturing it. So there is a world where you can still keep board control even after that point which is absolutely fine. So, yeah, because of those reasons, I still feel okay playing into this line when it comes to that situation. Uh, because if they don't have it, they pretty much instantly lose the game because so many of their later plays just get immediately bricked by the wing leader. Um, and if they do have it, it's not necessarily that bad for you. So I think it's okay, generally. But in general, you just want to go face into this deck. Um, ECL Poe on the leader is great. Uh, because it one-shots the leader, and you can often action stall to force the deploy before spending anything because of the fact that you go so wide, and they're already trying to deal with your board, whereas you can just swing face with everything so you don't have to worry about any uh, any taking any trades there. Um, but also the fact that, you know, you can still deploy your leader and swing your leader, which can be two actions that you get leeway into them. Um, and also, if you have another one drop that you can free play off of your leader skill, that's another action you can get ahead. So, you can really just action stall until they're forced to deploy their leader, and then just ECL the Poe in afterwards to one shot it. Um, if they don't deploy and they start passing into you, it kind of depends on what the board state is, because um, if they if you're already super ahead, you can absolutely just claim initiative with five up and keep swinging base, especially if they're super close to lethal. But most of the time, that's probably not going to be the case. And in those situations where you're not threatening lethal in like one or two turns, then you might honestly be better just to go wide and play as much things off of your leader deployed skill as possible that turn, using your resources um, as efficiently as possible. 
or even potentially just playing the Poe for five is absolutely fine as well. Um, saving the five resources to threaten their leader deploy is not going to be worth it if you take that trade and just claim initiative there. Because five resources is a lot to develop your board in. A deploy is a very powerful skill, but it is not worth five resources if you're just trading them every turn. And if you're going to handshake them on your five resource turn, you're kind of committed to handshaking that every single turn where they hold the deploy like that. Um, so I feel like generally, unless you're super ahead at, the, at that point already, then you can just afford to let them deploy, play as much stuff as possible for the next turn. And then as soon as they deploy and swing, take something out, untap two, maybe play another unit. You can just go into next turn with ECL still available to you. You can ECL Poe or ECL Wrecker, which is going to be even stronger, clear their leader and potentially clear something else. So holding the five resources to delay their deploy is not necessarily worth it in a lot of cases. Um, and I feel like that can be a mistake that people new to the deck will make is just focusing on that leader deploy um, and making sure that they can't go for it. Whereas a lot of the time, just developing your board more is going to be way more worth it and saving that ECL for the next turn to potentially go for an even bigger blowout. Um, Dr. Everzan is the scariest opener for this matchup because of the amazing trades it can take, um, but it's not actually played all that much nowadays. Uh, it was played a lot earlier in the set, I think, but people have started to cut it a lot from Bobby Yellow lists. And if you energy conversion lab on fighters for freedom, then you will win the game if they drop it. So you do actually have an out to Everzan, which is great. Um, I did use the side Ketsu into the deck in this matchup when um, when I was scared of Dr. Everzan before we ran fighters for freedom. But fighters for freedom just solves the whole issue and it can just be a win button if they take the risk of dropping the Everzan. Red 3 is generally pretty rough in this matchup if they have 7th Fleet Defender, but then that's also 3 mana that they're not going to spend on dealing with the ground um, if they drop it. So you're absolutely fine for them to drop 7th Fleet Defender. If they drop it, you just don't play space, and then you can keep pushing ground unit, ground units into their base, and they're going to be effectively 3 mana behind for the game because the 7th Fleet Defender isn't actually doing anything, because um, you're way less scared of dying to Boba Yellow faster than you can kill them. Uh, but if they don't drop 7th Fleet Defender, then you can just drop Red 3 and there's it's really hard for them to come back from that point if you've gone wide. There are even some cases where on the turn where they drop the 7th Fleet Defender, it can be worth dropping Red 3 just to push a little bit extra damage on your ground units. Um, especially if they're not able to take very many trades, the action after you drop the Red 3 into the ground, then you just get a lot of burst damage. Uh, from the red 3 then and there, and then they're forced to take the trade into your red 3 as one of the first actions for the next turn, which means that you have leniency to do something else, especially if you have a card like Poe down, then they're going to have to deal with the Poe, then you can swing the red 3 into base, uh, and you get 3 free damage before they get the trade in. So yeah, there's a lot of um, back and forth when it comes to the action economy around red 3 in this matchup, um, but generally it can be okay to drop um, but the, the main scary card is 7th Fleet Defender, obviously. And that's pretty much all I have on Bobby Yellow. So moving on to another very common deck. One that was very underrepresented at UKGE, to be honest. Uh, I was very surprised not to play against any Kira, and when it looked at the stats, I think there were 5 or 6 people playing it overall, which is crazy to me. Uh, this was a deck that I was highly considering picking up and playing, because I'm naturally a control player. I really enjoy playing control and mid-range decks. Um, and so Kira was a deck that I was super excited to try out myself. But the main reason I didn't play it was because I thought that there was going to be mirror matches everywhere. I expected to play at least two, if not three, Kira matchups uh, throughout the day. Um, and yeah, I didn't see it at all. It ended up winning the event, but there was no other Kira in the top 16. And there were like five players on it overall, which is absolutely crazy to me. I think I think this deck is very, very strong amongst the top three in the game, potentially. Um, and so going on to the Kira matchup. The Kira matchup is a very interesting one. I started out thinking that it would be really rough. And then with the updates to the deck, the matchup just felt kind of fine ever since. 
Um, and the main reason for that is the turn one Hylobon Enforcer is the main issue for this matchup, as it can potentially take two value trades with the shield, and that will transition them cleanly into the mid and late game. Um, initially, Sabine is your early answer to this, as you will always get initiative if you just play Sabine, as they have to take two actions, one to play the Hylobon, one to shield it. So there's no world where you're just going to play Sabine and they're going to end up with initiative and the 3-2 shielded. So Sabine can be a nice answer to it. It is a one-for-one, one, which you don't really want to go for in the control matchups. Uh, it's not so bad because you get the bounty claim, so you do get to draw a card. But generally, one-for-ones are what you want to stay away from in the control matchups. Um, if you don't have any other way to deal with the Hylobon in your hand, though, then you are just going to be forced to take that trade. And it's it's better than them being able to trade into two units with the Hylobon anyways. Um... However, the new addition to the deck being the Fighters for Freedom is absolutely huge into the High Level Enforcer. Um, their leader is going to deploy as a 4-4, so saving ECL for it is actually not necessary. And if they start with a High Level Enforcers, then you can actually just Energy Conversion Lab Fighters for Freedom on turn 2. Just play a 2-drop turn 1, they have to still take 2 actions to uh, shield it up. And then you get to claim and just ECL the Fighters for Freedom on turn 2 for a massive board swing. Um, because the Saboteur will clear off the shield, the Fighters for Freedom will live on 1 health. You get to claim the bounty and draw a card. And then you still have your 2-drop alive. So they don't even get to take a 1-for-1 one one trade with the Hylobon, which is huge. Obviously, them getting the ECL out is very nice for them. But like I say, it's actually not that valuable in this kind of a matchup. Because of the fact that their leader is deploying as a 4-4. Four four, so you can generally just answer it with the cards you've got on board. There's a couple of other things you can use to answer it, like Heroic Sacrifice. Um, but, yeah, generally you don't need to worry about their leader deploying and being a massive board swing. Um, if you do end up saving ECL, and they, this is generally going to be in the case where you either don't see the Fighters for Freedom or they don't have the Hylobon Enforcers, then you kind of have a safety net against things like ECL Gideon from them into a deploy. You can either ECL... Uh, IG-11 or Poe, as their units will often be damaged from trades or leader deploy, uh, and those units can often clear two things on the ECL. Um, if you do save ECL for the five resource turn, then using it on the lead leader deploy is still good, um, as long as there's something else that you can kind of get value from the IG or the Poe skill as well. Uh, or the other alternative is if they're potentially threatening a very strong couple of trades with their leader that you can't really do anything about otherwise. Um, you can also cheat in a Po or an IG on four resources to have the same effect as you should realistically have board control by then, especially if you've been able to resolve the Fighters for Freedom into the Hylobon Enforcers. So I think there is a lot of merit to just cheating in a five drop on turn four against this deck, especially because of the fact that your lead, your units are all going to get damaged anyways by the leader deploy. So cheating stuff in is not actually that bad until the point where they deploy because it, it doesn't change anything. They're planning to do the same thing that your leader's doing already. Um, but it also means that you're threatening the Poe or the IG to clear their leader or to deal with whatever they go for on five resource. And that often demands an immediate answer, like a Fell the Dragon, like a takedown. Uh, potentially they even use ECL just to get a one-for-one -one trade onto it if they're really in dire straits. Um, and that just means that they've skipped their entire five resource turn to deal with your play. Uh, they've gone for a one-for-one, -one, which at that point you should have board control, so a one-for-one -one is not too bad for you. And then you can just push more damage face, you can use all five of your resources to deal with the um, with the Kira deploy or the rest of your like some of your board to deal with it, and yeah, it, it puts them behind quite a lot if you get to that point. Um, they'll also often hold their deploy for after you deploy your own leader to try and get maximum value. Uh, it also threatens a very nice value trade into them because Han is a three six. They can swing Kira into it, kill your leader, and then leave their leader up as a seven one to trade into something else next turn. Um, which does demand a big answer. Um, but what you can do to punish that potential greed is if they do hold their deploy for after you deploy your leader to get maximum value there, then you can actually just cheat in Wrecker on 5 resource uh, without getting punished. Because if they deploy after you've deployed, you can cheat in Wrecker, 
the fact that you've killed your own resource isn't going to prevent you from deploying because you've already done it. And then the Wrecker can just one-shot their leader with the five damage effect. You don't even have to use ECL on it, which is amazing. Um, another thing to note is they don't have great ways to contest a red three early. Uh, once you do get board control, I think the only space unit that you really see is uh, Inferno 4. There might be some builds out there that are super anti-aggro that are trying to run Consortium Star Viper. But generally, I think the early space unit from them is going to be Inferno 4, which um, obviously Red 3 can just trade into and then come out on top. Or you can just go face with it and then they're going to take two turns to kill the Red 3, which is massive value for you. The fact that it takes two actions to kill that your one unit. Um, also, the fact that Red 3 can clear an Inferno 4 with one attack uh, with initiative is absolutely huge because another card that you really need to play around is Overwhelming Barrage, which is a big problem for the deck in general, just because of the fact that you're playing a lot of your units damaged. So the Red 3 can prevent a small Overwhelming Barrage uh, if they've had an Inferno 4 stick around for a couple of turns after maybe turn 2 or turn 3. Um, and then they go for a leader deploy. You may be able to clear their leader, but then they Overwhelming Barrage on the Inferno 4, sure it's only 4 damage split, but that can be enough with how wide you go and how small your units can be, uh, especially after the leader deploy, to just clear up enough units for them to take control of the game. So the red 3 can be really nice to deal with that. Um, and just generally, Overwhelming Barrage is a big card you have to keep in your mind when you're playing this matchup, uh, and you have to really make sure to keep board control against them, um, especially around that leader deploy. If they deploy naked with 5 up, you have to kill it that action because they're they're just looking to overwhelming barrage you and there's no question about that um another thing to note and this is another general note for this deck but it's also quite specific for this matchup as well is that you don't have to be afraid to go into the late game this is not necessarily an aggro deck it can play as an aggro deck but it can also play uh as more of a mid-range deck and that's where the zoo play style comes into effect like Sure, you play as an aggro deck into a lot of matchups, but you're really just looking to keep control of the board above all else, and then from there you can transition that into damage on base. Um, and sometimes against some decks, it just takes longer for you to establish full on board control. Um, so this is one of those options where you can go somewhat late into this matchup as long as you keep pushing damage, but you do have to be careful of Snoke, Super Laser Blast, and Avenger, as those are the three ways that they're going to be able to close out games. Um, make sure not to go wide enough that you lose to a Snoke or a Super Laser Blast immediately, but just have a few units lingering around that you don't mind losing to an Avenger so that you can also threaten damage through that. If you've just got a Wrecker on board and they drop Avenger, there's not a whole lot that you can do from there unless they've already taken quite a lot of damage and you can threaten lethal next turn. Um, Cassian is a great card into Super Laser Blast. If they have to Super Laser Blast your board as their first action, then it can just get a little bit more damage through, but it's also obviously not costing you cards in hand, which is great into those control matchups. Um, and also Wrecker clears Sm Snoke for the most part. It leaves him on one health, but generally you'll have something else on board that isn't either dying to Smoke Snoke or being sat on zero attack from it that you can then trade into it and just nullify the Snoke's whole effect. So Wrecker is honestly a really, really solid card in this matchup. The fact that it can clear your clear their leader with just the effect, and also just the effect will help you deal with Snoke there as well. Um, that's pretty much all the notes I have about Kira. I do feel like this matchup is pretty favoured into you, um, unless they're going super anti-aggro with their uh, main and sideboard. But I feel like most lists nowadays aren't doing that. Uh, they've taken after the one that did well in Gen Con, which has a lot of tools against aggro, don't get me wrong, but it's not entirely built to deal with aggro. There's, you know, still big ships in there that can break their hands, um, and there's still quite a lot of top end there that isn't going to do a whole lot against you. So, moving on to the last matchup that I wanted to cover, and this was one that I believe was highly overrepresented at uh, the Leicester tournament, and that is the new hand leader with a blue base. So, Hand Blue was actually, I think, the most represented deck in the Leicester tournament, which to me is kind of crazy. Um, it has been popping up a lot recently, especially in the Gen Con tournaments 
and it is kind of the new kid on the block, so to speak, uh, almost replacing the Ray Red builds of old. Um, there is definitely something to the deck. It, it has a lot of nice options, but it's not nearly on the same level as the three decks that we mentioned before, the Sabine, the Boba Cunning, the Kira ECL, or Kira just green bases in general. Those three decks are far and away better than this list, than this deck in my opinion. And to be honest, I don't rate this deck all that highly in general. I think it's a decent deck, but I don't think it's anything special. I think that it's just getting played quite a lot now because it is the new deck to play. And it is it is very fun to play as well because you get to use cards like Force Throw and Pillage, which are, are very fun to use. Not fun to get uh, play into, unfortunately. But yeah, I think this deck is, is decent, but I don't think it is anything crazy. I think that it's just got... I think that it's just got a lot of representation due to recent events where it's done pretty well, but also just the fact that it's quite a new deck in comparison to some of the other ones that we've mentioned. And this was a matchup that, again, I played um, throughout the day, uh, Kira being the only matchup that I didn't end up playing in the tournament, but I've played a lot in testing. So there's a few different things to um, note about the hand blue deck, and it's got kind of a few different cards that you need to play around at specific points in the game. Um, the first one being the big one is the fact that they can obviously drop the Luke 7 drop on turn 6, uh, or on 6 resource, sorry. And so the main way that you want to play around that obviously is going to be to clear their board before they hit 6 resources. If you leave units up on their 6 resource turn and they're able to get a 1 for 1 trade even, then it's going to be good for them because it means they're going to get maximum value out of the Luke, they're going to get the full minus 6 minus 6, and they can potentially kill a Wrecker or a Poe or a Cassian just straight up from the on-play effect. And that can be really swingy for you. Um, it can be really, really bad just in general. So ideally, you need to clear the board before they hit six resources. That is just a really, really big thing to keep in note. You should almost imagine a clock going down every time they pass turn um, because you need to keep that board clear on six resource. That's that's the main thing to note when it comes to this uh, matchup. Um, going on to further things, Energy Conversion Lab on Poe and IG is absolutely perfect as not only does it one-shot their leader, uh, and again, similar to the Boba um, matchup that we mentioned before, you can often action stall way more than them as you go a lot wider. You have a lot more one-drops that you can free play off of your leader to stay at that five resource open before they deploy. Um, not only is the fact that Poe and IG on both on six attack amazing for the matchup and five drops in there deploying on five resource, but they'll also often have damaged units to kill with the Poe or the IG skill alongside the leader. Um, and they also don't have ECL, which means they can't do the same thing to you. Like they can't, Wrecker and Poe are not as good in the deck. I think sometimes Poe still gets played. I don't know if Wrecker even sees play in the deck because the defeating the resource is pretty huge. Um, but they just can't ECL anything onto you because they don't play it, which is amazing. Like, ECL is the scariest thing you have to watch out for when playing this game right now, uh, especially with the addition of cards like Poe and Wrecker. So the fact you don't have to play around that is absolutely huge, and you just get a free board swing above them because of the way that your deck is built. Um, and yeah, Poe and IG often can clear two units, one being their leader on the deploy turn, which is absolutely insane. Um, a lot of the time you don't have the opportunity to do that for the simple fact that you need to be clearing their force units, which I'll get onto a little bit later, but there are, there are some very nice times where that will come up and there are some times where you might even leave their leader alive for like a turn or two, just so you can get extra value on the ECL. Um, but again, that depends on whether you can clear the rest of their board, because if you can clear the rest of their board, then clearing their leader is worth it too, just to prevent the Luke play that I mentioned before. Um, now when it comes to that Luke play, Wrecker is actually amazing in this matchup because when they do cheat in Luke on 6 resource, it comes in as a 6-5 because of the 2 damage from your leader skill. Um, so when they cheat it in, you actually don't even need energy conversion lab or to trade into it at all to kill it because they'll be on 6 resource, you'll also be on 6 resource of course. So that means you could just play Wrecker and the 5 damage from the on play skill will kill the Luke. 
and suddenly you have board control again. Um, they were able to kill one unit with the Luke, they don't get any value out the restore three, no value out the attacks, and you get a 7-6 or a 7-4 if you want to cheat it in with Overwhelm. Um, obviously, if you don't see Poe or IG early enough, Wrecker can still be a great ECL target, and you can clear their leader still with Wrecker and something else with the on-play. Um, it can be especially good if for some reason they go for a Luke whilst they have the leader down. You can ECL Wrecker to clear the leader and then use the on-play to clear the Luke. That can be absolutely insane. Um, it's very rare that that sort of thing will happen, but it can come up. Um, but it, the fact that Wrecker can clear the six uh, resource Luke is absolutely huge because it, it just means that you have more leeway to use the ECL on five resource to clear their leader and the rest of their board just to make it harder for them to get the maximum value out of the Luke on play as well. So you really have a almost pincer attack from the turn before and the turn of play of that six resource Luke, which is the main scary thing about the hand blue deck. Um, another thing to note again, similar to the Kira, but honestly more emphasis on this than the Kira matchup is that you don't need to be scared to go to long game versus this deck. Obviously, ideally you kill them quickly and you go grab lunch in between rounds, but uh, you can honestly just go longer with Pose and Wreckers, and especially once it comes to sideboard, when you add in home ones and potential two sides, um, you absolutely can go the long game against this deck. They do have big drop, big bombs. They have cards like Crate Dragon, Luke, obviously Redemption. Those are the main three I think you need to watch out for. But you also have big bombs. Uh, Wrecker and Poe and IG are all absolutely amazing cards. Um, home ones again from side will be great, especially once it gets to that late game to heal some damage off your base, but also just to give you some value. And they don't really have the best ways to deal with home one. By that point, they'll often use a lot of their Felder Dragons to deal with your early pose and wreckers. And home one can get a nice value trade over redemption if you need to. Um, they also don't really have that many other good space units, like Restored Arc is about it, I think. Um, maybe they run the the uh, A-Wing, the Green Squadron A-Wing, but I don't think most builds are running that, to be honest. And even then, it doesn't trade into Home 1, um, unless you've already traded into the Redemption there. So, yeah, you really don't need to be scared to play into the long game on, against this deck. Uh, I played a best in the round that I played against Han Blue in the tournament. We went to game three, and in the third game, which I ended up winning, uh, I believe we ended up going to either turn 12 or turn 14, something like that, which is honestly crazy if you consider this deck an aggro deck, which I don't personally, but um, it, a lot of people are considering it as an aggro deck, which, um, you know, changes the perspective of it overall. It means that probably in that matchup, my opponent maybe sided out their crate Dragons and some of their top end that wasn't just going to heal them, uh, and it allowed me to play the long game a lot better. Um, and again, against my in my Ray Yellow matchup, um, I did a similar sort of thing where game one I played super aggressive. I didn't, I couldn't push through. They took game one. Game two, I sided more control stuff, sided in home ones and everything, and they ended up uh, just losing the long game. And then they sided in more big stuff, and I went aggressive again, and their hand bricked, and they couldn't couldn't contest the aggression that I have. Um, the flexibility of this deck is a really big plus to it, and the fact that you can flip-flop between aggro and control uh, is, is absolutely huge, and this is one of the decks where you have the ability to do that. Uh, because their bombs, a lot of the time, aren't game-ending. If they keep in cards like Crate Dragon, then, which is the main game-ender for the deck, then you can often just kill them earlier than they can drop the Crate Dragon. But also, if they don't keep the Crate Dragon in, then you have late game because they have no way to really kill you. Um, smuggle in general is absolutely huge in this matchup, uh, which is why I've got the smuggle cards up there. Um, a lot of the time they'll spend a couple of turns in the mid game ignoring your board and pillaging to try and shut down any development that you might have for the board, um, especially when it gets to around five or six resource if they're scared of ECL, Poe or Wrecker or IG then they'll often just pillage stuff away and use any units that they have on the board to try and soak up some damage instead of taking it on the base. Also, a lot of their early units heal them, the odd one or two, which can slow things down for them to allow them the leniency to take a pillage turn early on. 
Um, so Smuggle is absolutely huge for that, just to fill out your curve a little bit, but also it's cards that you can play that don't require them to be in your hand. Um, and also something that's very nice to do in this matchup is, first of all, you can keep one drops in hand, which is another reason why I've got this Reckless Gunslinger up. It acts as a Smuggle card, but it also acts as a one drop you can just keep in hand. Um, in the case that they develop a force unit that you can't clear and resolve a force throw, you can just discard a one drop. Sure, they deal one damage to something, but it's way better than them discarding a wrecker or something like that. Um, and that's something else that I wanted to bring up as well, is when playing around these discard decks like the Hand Blue and these discard cards in general, there are some turns where you will want to skip resource. That won't really come up until after you've hit five resources, but... If it gets to the point where you've got a Wrecker in hand and you really want to play it to deal with their Luke, but you've only got two other cards in your hand, and if you resource, they can pillage away your Wrecker and then just drop Luke next turn, you might just be better off not resourcing. And then they're kind of stuck in, if they drop the Luke, you can Wreck it. If they pillage, you can keep the Wrecker. Um, and you can just keep the board that you've developed swinging at their face. And they eventually, they have to answer it, right? So there are some times where skipping resource is very valuable against this kind of a deck as well. Um, a lot of the early game comes down to just taking good trades into their force units. You want to be preventing force throw and the forces with me at any cost. Um, those are the two main blowout cards into this matchup. I don't think forces with me is run all that much in this deck to be honest, but force throw is a three of in every list I've ever seen. And that card will win them games if they get to resolve multiple copies. So you really need to bear that card in mind. Uh, and playing around it either by keeping one drops or just by taking out their force units wherever you can. Um, and like I mentioned before, they generally don't have the best space units, so red 3 can be a pretty big blowout card, honestly, in this matchup. Um, I don't think they run the A-Wings generally. Uh, I think they tend to opt for the restored arc to try and get them to that late game instead, which doesn't trade into the red 3 very well. And yeah, you can just sit on a red 3 a lot of the time with your ground units developed and push a lot of damage to base. So that's the hand blue matchup, and that's all the matchups that I had to cover, to be honest. Um, apologies, this is obviously a longer video, but um, I think the Star Wars community are a little bit more used to that because I've seen a lot of long, uh, like, masterclass guide videos um, that are, like, over an hour long. So people seem to appreciate that. Hopefully you guys can appreciate this one. Um, leave any comments below if you think I missed anything or if there's anything you disagree with that I said. I'd be very interested. Obviously, I'm always here to learn, um, especially when it comes to this kind of deck that I've enjoyed playing quite a lot. Give this deck a whirl at your locals or at the next big tournament. I highly recommend it. It's a lot of fun to play. There's a lot of skill to it. Um, it's it's very interesting to play. It's, it's not the kind of deck that you expect there to be a, a big skill curve to, but there really is. Um, and a lot of it comes down to the stuff that I was mentioning in this video. So hopefully you guys enjoyed. Hopefully you learned something. Let me know down below. And I'll catch you guys in the next one.